Good day, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are on this uh, turbulent fast forward planet that's currently a pandemic planet. This is our weekly news review, uh, review of the news and the noise. And the idea here with these special guests is to separate news from noise a little bit, including not just in misinformation, but you know how readers can start to develop a uh, readers or watcher can develop this, their own habits and and capacity to filter and focus on what's meaningful and not. And we've had a number of weekly sessions that have been fantastic. Today, I'm showing you on the screen, of course, some of the uh, challenges. There's such a flow, and we've seen how many thousands of headlines on hydroxychloroquine just in the last hour, let alone um, the last few weeks. Uh, today, we're gonna have a special guest on in about 20 minutes, uh, Tina Rosenberg, who is one of the co-founders of a, an institution, kind of a microcosm within journalism that's uh, focused on solutions, which is something the media have a hard time uh, paying attention to amid all the, the conflict that we like and the um, the news frontiers that we all crave, you know, especially uh, everyone, uh, two of the three guests today are news, or, you know, from the newsroom. And that's the the new thing is the thing we we absolutely pay attention to in the media quite often. And that, but that comes, novelty comes with questions, uncertainty, but we don't do that well either. So Tina will explore what it means to be a solutions journalist. And, uh, but first we're gonna start with a little roundup of um, what folks are thinking and feeling. We have Wendy Wertheimer, who was a long time, a dec monthly decadal uh, staffer and employee and consultant at the World Health Organization first during the AIDS crisis and the National Institutes for Health, worked closely with Tony Fauci and so many of the others of, of the characters you've seen in the headlines lately. And we have uh, Bob Bazell, who for 30 plus years was uh, NBC's lead science co correspondent and is still dug in deeply and writing on these issues. And John Cohen out in uh, sunny California, a uh, surfboard probably visible somewhere in the back there, who is mm -hmm. uh, a master correspondent for Science Magazine, uh, who's digging deep um, day to day on these questions that we're all facing. Uh, so maybe we'll start with uh, Wendy. You were you posted a you sent us in our little internal email chat a lot of links to things that got you thinking, and uh, let's so let let us know what's in your bin, and ideal ideally with this idea of how we get past the the misperceptions. Hmm. Um, I read I I read a quote from Masha Gessen, and she said it's very important to continue to notice the ways in which our government is failing us, even if those ways have become familiar and exhausting. So I think I think it is exhausting. I think it's a, you know, I, I have to hold back from sending you guys all the, all the articles that I'm seeing that, that it, it, it's just a fire hose of information. And how do you, how do you separate out the little bits and you know, it seems to me in Washington, the Washington journalists are obsessed with hydroxychloroquine and whether the president is taking it and why the president doesn't wear a mask. But in the, in the press conference, when the president said, oh, ha, 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 I'm taking hydroxychloroquine. And he, when someone said to him, well, there's a study from the VA that this is not effective and may actually be dangerous, the president said that the people conducting this study weren't friends of the administration and that actually it was an enemy statement. So I guess for me, a question I have right now is, <coughs> are public servants who are conducting biomedical research and doing public health and academic science and all the people around the world who are trying to conduct all kinds of biomedical research. Is it now a question of whether your research is going to be taken seriously, whether or not you are a, considered a friend of the administration? And I, that to me was a really dangerous step that was taken that nobody questioned. And I haven't seen anything written about it since either. Um, so for me, I. I keep coming back to this idea that there is an undermining of, I don't think I'm answering your question, Andy, about well, how do you parse out information, but I, I do think there is this continual undermining of science, of scientists, of public health, um, taking information, at least there was, an, uh, there was also an article yesterday that 
the president doesn't like being briefed. He doesn't like being briefed by the intelligence briefer. Um, so I'm imagining it's the same thing with public health. And when Tony and all the others are briefing him, he only wants to hear what he wants to hear by some preconceived sense that he's gotten from Fox News and, uh, and other places. So I just worry about the chasm between the administration and the experts in the department and in the state and local governments uh, who are trying to do their jobs and, and present information to the public um, without it having to go through a political filter. And this trickles all the way down to the village scale. I live in a tiny village in the Hudson Valley and my wife is a village trustee. And just today they had their weekly county call. And there's no one, the county to determine they need 89 con contact tracers to get to the next level of opening. And they have 30 something. And there's no idea, no clarity on where the money is. They, they were, they're trying to find volunteer contact tracers. And all that devolves from that chain of, of lack of, guidance. And I, I don't know, if, uh, you know, John, you're dug in on this uh, a little, you know, a lot of the virological questions, but also the policy too. How, how, how big a deal do you think it is to have that? I, I mean, everyone seems to know it's such a huge deal to have a president with no direction. Or yeah, I think, I think Trump um, wanted there to be a state's rights sort of uh, approach to this, and it has become a free for all. And, you know, you're in it uh, with your little village and Wendy's in it with DC and I'm in it with uh, San Diego and Bob's in it with New York City. And it all depends on how you respond where you're at. And I think when Trump stopped doing the coronavirus task force press briefings, he faded out uh, in the conversation here a great deal. And, you know, Wendy's pointing out some things he, he said attacking science again. I think the message is just st starting to fall on deaf ears. And that's part of the reason there's not even, we don't want, we don't care about hydrochloroquine anymore. It's being studied. It's boring. You don't want to wear a mask, Donald Trump. Don't wear a mask. That's, it's your choice. That's fine. You know, is he set an example for the people where I live? No, you know, we're responding based on our situation and California, you know, San Diego, we're opening up now. And there was a really smart study put out yesterday by Johns Hopkins University. Um, that looked at the WHO mandate of, or, or direction, guidance, not a mandate, of <clears throat> when do you open up? What's the metric? Which is the great question, right? That's the pressing question. When can we go back to normal or near normal or new normal? And they have a, a, a metric of when testing in your area shows that 5% of people being tested are positive, that's a safe level at which to start re relaxing and opening up. San Diego is now at 4.7%. Our restaurants are opening now uh, with social distancing. So New York isn't in that situation. New York City certainly isn't. And Washington, D.C. isn't. I don't know about the Hudson Valley. But that, for the first time, gives me something to hold on to. And I'm not getting that message from the White House. And I'm not getting that message from the CDC. And I'm not getting it from the NIH. I'm getting it from a university that's taking advice from the World Health Organization that the Trump administration has decided isn't worthy of US government funding. And I don't really care what the White House has to say about it. I'm fascinated by what Johns Hopkins University is saying based on the WHO. And I think that's how things have evolved. So Bob and, and Tina has shown up in the, uh, in the green room, which is really exciting to get her on here. But you know, you've also, in being an NBC correspondent for so long, you've seen how these things play out in the context of presidential races and how, you know, it's pretty clear to, to me that, and to many observers that Trump, his main concern is getting reelected. You know, his main concern is his own future. Uh, it's pretty much, it's hard to interpret his actions sometimes other than that. And in that sense, what he's doing with masks or not doing with masks, while it's, I, I agree with John on that local level, every state has got a way to forge a path forward, but how big a problem is it to have this in a presidential year too, where the, you know, his focus and it'll increasingly be this battle of the masks in that context. Well, Trump's damage has been obvious for so long and before coronavirus, this coronavirus ever came around. And it comes up with issues 
that have to do with the health costs of cutting back regulations on mercury and uh, getting out of the Paris uh, peace accords and things like that. And how much do people care? This is really different because people care about their own health in a way that they don't care about a lot of other things. And, right. and they can, the, the rest of it can be noise. But a lot of people are very concerned about if my kids go back to school, will my grandmother or my mother or their, their child's grandmother be at risk for death? That's a very real question. That's a profound question. And it may be in the, in the long run no more important than the damage from global warming. But people have to make that choice. And it's really a, we'll, we're in this experiment, we'll, we, we will find out how much that complete lack of guidance from the government officials has left people in a quandary where they are making decisions themselves, often on the basis of what their neighbors do or their family does or uh, their friends tell them they're doing it in other parts of the country. So I, I don't have a clear answer to that, but people are, are searching for things in a situation where they're not used to having to search for it. Uh, they will, they will they, you know, not, not everybody can read Johns Hopkins' uh, latest metrics like John, John can and, and or the people in the, the local government there, but the other people are just kind of sniffing around and they're not just buying into it. They're not saying, well, it's safe to go into a restaurant. And it, there's all these polls that show that despite even in areas where restaurants open, people are very scared to go into a restaurant because they are, because it's them, it's their health and their family's health. And, and I have never seen a situation like that uh, where, where people, except as I mentioned before in the early days of HIV when there was very little known and there was a lot of argument about it or when the anthrax attacks were happening and there wasn't a lot of information about what was really going on. People were genuinely scared for themselves, but they eventually got guidance from above. Here we know, everybody knows that this guy is a clown and they either love him for his foolishness, Trump I mean, uh, or they hate him, but they still have this other concern. And the other concern is, will this kill my grandma? And that's, we've never seen that before. So in a way that you think that feels like it can uh, sort of overcome some of that um, fog that's created by- Right, because people have to make a decision and they'll make it right. based on what they did, determined to be the best information. And if you have a good county health official or a good governor, uh, then people will turn to that person and sort of ignore uh, the Trump follies that are going on in Washington and have been going on for so long that they, as you know, the others have pointed out, but it's just a lot of noise now. Yeah, Andy, I, I agree with Bob that it's a, it's a horribly difficult thing to put people in the position of individually making these decisions. I'd like to just show, can you share my screen for a second and show this Hopkins graphic? Because it's not hard to read. You mean uh, the, 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 the tracker? Uh, no, it's not the tracker. No, no, it's, it's, a, new, it's a new graphic. I, I could give you the link. And you if you, yeah, pop the link into that private chat box and I yeah, can pull it up. I'll do that. And yeah, it's still, that's one of the limitations on this uh, platform. I can't just flip your screen on. I, it's a little complicated, but we'll um, get to that. And we'll get to Tina Rosenberg and solutions journalism in a second as well, which uh, I still, you know, in most newsrooms, that's still a hard sell, I think, uh, in the flurry of stuff getting pushed around. Okay, here we go. Wait a second. And so this is a state by state um, tracker. And what, what it shows you is the 5% level of that's 5% of people who test positive in your place. Now it's dependent upon how widely available testing is, of course. If you're not doing any testing, you're not going to see anything. But the green states are the ones that are below the 5% and the orange ones are above. So you can look at your state and get a sense of where you fit in, in terms of opening up. It, it's a pretty graphic representation. Yeah. What I think is um, reliable information for the most part. I don't trust every state is doing enough testing, but that's a variable I can't control. And then there's the contact tracing question too. Um, Johns Hopkins today, right? Today is the first day of this. Uh, I think uh, 200,000 people signed up for a, a free course on how to be a contact tracer. 
and I do know several people in the Washington area who are actually signed up and they're going to be getting paid to do this. Uh, yeah. and Andy, one of the solutions here to speak of solutions and Tina's effort, one of the solutions is to learn from other countries. And what China and other countries have done in Asia that's been very successful is used apps on phones as a substitute for people doing traditional contact tracing. Some of it is draconian and it frightens us. And I have an interview that just went up, I think, with a leading China CDC um, expert saying that one of their great success stories has been a green, yellow, red health card system on their cell phones that they track you with GPS and they know if you've been in contact with the case. Now, would we ever allow that here? I don't think so, but right. it works. And there are other ways to do it that are contact tracing light with apps that we have another story up at Science um, posted last night about this that looks at friendlier app versions um, that get away from what your village is facing, needing a huge workforce to do contact tracing. Yeah, well, this is where theoretically uh, there's enough brilliance in Silicon Valley to create apps uh, about everything from when you should shave, I assume, to whatever. and and you would think this could be a possibility quickly. Of course, the protecting privacy is the key part. And this is one of the challenges in a big fat democracy, especially a variegated one like the United States, um, finding that balance between information access and impact and freedom. I am gonna introduce Tina now. So hold on a second. Um, it's great to have you here. Thanks, Andy, great to be here. So oh, Tina, yeah. Tina Rosenberg, a Pulitzer Prize winner, former New York Times colleague of mine and uh, who, had this idea with David Bornstein. And were there any others in that first cohort? Courtney Martin. Courtney Martin, uh, to, to, that there's a need for something uh, in, in the newsroom that was lacking. Could you just describe that moment when you had this realization? Sure. Um, I mean, the, the realization is that journalists tend to consider, we define news as what's wrong. And by doing so, we give a really incomplete picture of society and we should also cover what people are doing to solve problems, not as fluff or good news, but as stories and report on them with rigor, not celebrating those solutions, but reporting on them, what's working and what's not working about them. And then this came to me in a story I was doing in the year 2000, where I was, and John, this will be somewhat familiar to you, uh, reporting on the price of AIDS medicines in poor countries. You, you scooped me and it pissed me off. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, the fact that in the countries where the AIDS burden was the highest, the um, no one could afford these drugs because Washington and the pharmaceutical industry were putting this enormous pressure on countries not to make or buy generic versions of drugs. And I had pitched it to my editor that way. And he said, nah, too depressing. And we cannot do another long story about how everybody's gonna die in Malawi who has HIV. Mm -hmm. But there was a country that was providing these drugs that was making them generic versions for free and providing them for every, to everyone, and that was Brazil. So I wrote about what Brazil was doing and in the process, what they had to fend off, all this pressure. And, um, and that was a much better way to tell this story. It was fresher, it was more empowering and exciting to readers. It actually had some impact because it showed that poor countries could treat their, their, their people with HIV. Um, and so from then on, every time I, was going to write about something that an editor would say, oh, that's too depressing, which was about 100% of what I wrote. Um, I asked, was there a possible solutions approach there? And out of that, the column in the New York Times, Fixes, started, which is still going on. Right. And, and, uh, and then we started the Solutions Journalism Network in 2013 to spread this idea to other news organizations. Well, it would be very useful uh, to follow up on that. Uh, to look at fixes right now with COVID. Uh, yeah, that, that, that article was fantastic. Uh, <laughs> 2001, we all remember that. Team. It'll be on my gravestone. <laughs> what, a migraine headache? Hmm? You said migraine? No, it'll be on I my gra gravestone. <laughs> oh, your gravestone. Sorry. I, was like, I would love to see a solutions piece about migraines. Yes, <laughs> that's a good idea. A different idea. But, but, as we come out, of, as places reopen in the United States, it would be really nice to focus on the places that reopen and don't have problems. I mean, everybody yeah. loved that story about the guy, the, the Uber driver in Florida, who had been a MAGA hat wearer and then uh, 
said that there was no such thing as uh, COVID D, and then he got it. Right. Uh, that that uh, that story got a lot of you know anger on both sides, and it plays into the anger story. But but what about a place that opens successfully and has a minimum number of, uh, yeah. of illnesses? Now I don't know that that's going to happen because we're in the middle of this. I keep saying this, but we are in an experiment where there's just not results yet. We don't know how to open successfully in the United States after it got as bad as we did. I mean, we have success stories like New Zealand, where they did it right in the first place. Yeah. And that, that's great to say that, but that really doesn't help us at all. It doesn't tell you whether uh, Bend, Oregon can open up uh, in, in some kind of way and be successful. But it, we'll have to wait a little while. But it's not a bad idea to think about looking for those stories. Where well, China's China a, a success story. We just don't want to look at their success because we don't like things that they've done to succeed. Well, another way to frame that, though, is that countries around the world have completely different political and cultural landscapes. So it's never a simple comparison. Like I saw a lot of that with South Korea. And, um, you know, what people forget is that South Korea is on a wartime footing 24 seven. So their hospitals are responsive, their communities are responsive and to, to authority. And even though there was some mess ups there, as, as Lori pointed out here, I think a month or two ago, because some of the key people were in a religious uh, group that was not very reality oriented. But Tina, could you describe a few of the, like a menu of what you see, yeah. what you're, you're collating through the story tracker you have? Uh... Yeah, sure. So one of the things we do at Solutions Journalism Network, besides work with newsrooms, is collect solution stories. Um, and we have over 9,000 now. Um, we have over 500, perhaps over 600 that are COVID related. And they're from newsrooms all over the place. And they're all focused on what's working. This is an unusual time in that every single place in the world is facing the same thing or just has or is about to. And everyone's trying to solve it. So there's an awful lot we can learn from each other. And there's um, lots and lots of stories in there about what makes success. Um, we have a story that I was looking at recently saying, you know, here's, look at the countries that have reopened successfully. What do they have in common? Well, it's not a surprise. They're all doing, you know, contract tracing and testing and, um, and continuing to social distance in a way. And, but, but there's lessons we can distill from the experiences, not just on a large scale of here's why Korea succeeded, but on a small scale. I mean, here's a program that's connecting um, farmers who have their crops rotting in their field with food banks. Right. Farmers can't sell to restaurants anymore, but there's, there's a, a donation platform and people are paying to pay farmers to ship to get that food within 48 hours to a food bank. All sorts of stuff like that is going on and we need to know about it. I mean, Newsrooms have historically defined local as what's going on in our coverage area, but local also is what's going on elsewhere that we need to know about in our coverage area. And, and how much of that is a function of the media? Something else we've discussed here, and I think about a lot, is what's the role of the media in enabling community communicativeness? So it's not just any one of us going with a pad and interviewing people and telling you your story back to you which is the traditional model to this model of creating platforms or processes through which local communities can do that sharing. Hey, you know, we tried this and, you know, actually there's this free thing to learn how to be a contact tracer. And is that right. a part of the future too? Is that part of solutions? Well, everyone's a reporter now and everybody can be a journalist. You know, you have a blog and, you know, you can say, hey, I'm just like Tom Friedman. I know I'm expressing my opinion. <laughs> um, and you might be doing a better job than Tom Friedman. Um, but so we tend to work with uh, places that really do journalism and they don't have to be newspapers. They can be, you know, local community radio or, or local TV or, um, you know, national online platforms. But the, the point is to say, what's, what are people, how are people reacting to the various aspects of this pandemic that's working? Right. Not just containing COVID, but how are we dealing with schooling? How are we dealing with treating, you know, giving, getting people their chemotherapy? Um, you know, how are we doing with um, all this plastic waste that's coming up as a result of 
of COVID. I mean, there's there's so many aspects to COVID right now, and um, all of them are challenges, and all of them have people doing things about them that we need to learn from. So, Wendy, uh, you're you're a news consumer, and more, you know, we all are as well, obviously. But when you think about the landscape here, and think back to all the the other issues you've dealt with uh, from AIDS forward. Um, and we, we, again, we pay attention a lot to the noise and the confusion and the disinformationists. Um, is, do you see your own signs of how to get through this in a way that can build that sense of solutions focus, whether it's the media or the public? Well, I have two, two ideas about that. One is, you know, those stories even in the last couple of days that CDC is conflating its own information. So on the one hand, you've got the government sort of needing to sort out its information. But the, the thing I'm struck by, Tina, is one of our previous conversations here, we talked about the fact that there's not a real advocacy movement yet around COVID. And that unlike the AIDS epidemic, when the gay community sort of took it on early. So it seems to me that solutions journalism almost helps play a role in advocacy. I mean, if what advocates are trying to do is recommend how you fix problems, um, it seems like journalism has a, is playing, whether it's the right role or the wrong role, um, mm -hmm. is, is almost substituting for a really good advocacy uh, community um, and but at the same time needing to work against what is a really well-formed anti-science anti-vax sort of Fox News um, that side seems really well organized um, but it seems like that what we need is a is advocacy for exactly for solutions around this pandemic that journalism has a really special role it could play. I don't know if you see that as part of your mission or not, but. Actually, we we really don't. Um, and I, I know where you're coming from, but we are very clear to distinguish solutions journalism from advocacy. We're not trying to pick winners. We're not trying to say this is what should happen. We're just saying, here's what's going on and here's the results they're getting. That's what solutions journalism is. It's just covering the news. The news just, in this case, is how someone is trying to solve a problem. Now, obviously, that can provide um, good information that advocates can use, as, as can problem-focused journalism. But, but we are very careful to distinguish solutions journalism from advocacy because, um, frankly, most journalists in the United States would not be comfortable with it if, it were, if they were saying it could be advocacy. Also, we're trying to distinguish solutions journalism from good news. Right. Can we talk about that a little bit? Because that came up in some of our emails ahead of ahead of this. Ha, you know, I think is it is it it's different than saying, "Hey, we need a happy story today. We need a bright." That I think bright is like a thing. Let's put a bright in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, Bob, you must know this. Uh, There's a story that that uh, I thought didn't get enough play yesterday, although it was in the Washington Post and USA, USA Today, which is not nowhere. But it's it was an important story in terms of solutions. Is that the, the CDC, when it was finally allowed to release some information, uh, said that fomites touching things is not much of a risk for COVID-19. Uh, it's not as much of a risk. When a new virus comes along, you assume that that's going to be part of the risk. It's a big risk for things like norovirus. But it turns out with COVID, there's a, I, I discovered a man in the bowels of the CDC whose name I wasn't allowed to use in any kind of reporting. But he's been, only, he's been looking at this very question, whether you could get COVID just by touching a railing. And there's been a lot of uh, talk about that because for obvious reasons. But the fact that it's not much of uh, in in this man's scientist's uh, estimation, it's not much of a risk is important because it, it means you can maybe go stay in a bed and breakfast and not have to worry about wiping down everything, every place you're going if you want to take a short summer vacation. And it means you can go out in the park and not be terrified of, uh, that you might touch the railing up, uh, by accident. 
And that's, that's a piece of solution that, that matters. And it didn't get enough. Uh, the public health people are afraid to say, well, stop washing your hands because as we all know, one of the primary lessons of risk communication is to give people something to do. And the first thing you do is say, wash your hands. It turns out that's not as critical as, as social distancing. And that's an important piece of solutions. There's a basic rubric of scientific papers of problem solution. And in science journalism, the bulk of my stories are problem sol solutions. The solutions are never, are very rarely realized, but that's not the point. It's pointing in the direction that we have new information that's somehow addressing the problem. And, and that is what I like about what, what you're pushing, Tina, because that to me is the essence of good storytelling. You know, if you're just talking about problems, it, it doesn't give me as satisfying of an experience as a reader. I want to know potential solutions and just the horrible situation we're in. Yeah, we're in, we're in a shitty situation. Yeah. Tell me more. Tell me what we might do to somehow make things better, even if those things aren't solid and known, even if there are all these uncertainties around it. That's why I like science, because it embraces that very concept. And so to me right now, I'm, I'm incredibly interested in the vaccine story. It's always been my first love in, in science writing, and it is a potential solution to this great problem. That's what so fascinates me because it offers a way out. And do we have a vaccine? No. Are there problems with every single aspect of this speeded up vaccine search? Yes, and conflict is the other great engine of stories. So I see the structure of journalism through that lens. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it is unsatisfying. And people constantly, civilians, get the need for solutions journalism instinctively. Of course you should be reporting on what works. We find that journalists want to do that, but they're afraid to because they don't want it coming out sounding like cheerleading or advocacy or PR. And so we, what we do is teach techniques so it doesn't come out sounding like that. But I wanna get back to the distinction between good news and solutions journalism. There's a huge need for good news right now. Google reports that searches for good news have are astronomical. There's there's um, shows like John Krasinski's a little um, YouTube video program, which he just sold to CBS <laughs> for some astronomical sum mm -hmm. called Some Good News. But that's different. That's like, hey, let's interview the kid who set up a lemonade stand in Florida, and the proceeds are going to go to help right. buy masks. Those are stories that make you feel good about the about humans and and are and are talking about people doing really generous and nice things, but they're not really sustainable and and replicable solutions to this problem. Um, so I mean, what we're talking about is something different, and there's overlap. There's stories about what people are doing that also qualify as as great human interest stories, but the key really is. Is this something that other places would want to learn from to try and do the same thing? And Bob, you mentioned the, um, this guidance from the CDC. And for us, that's not what we would consider solutions journalism. What, it's not really a tool that you'd use for covering breaking news like an announcement like that. What would be a solution story out of that is, is if a city says, we're gonna revise our, our guidance so that you actually don't have to worry about touching those railings, but we do really emphasize the mask wearing and the social distancing, and let's see what results come out of that. Then you could then come in and write a solution story. Here's something new that a city tried. What happened as a result? Mm -hmm. and, and could you talk a little bit about, uh, mentioning the toolkit, uh, one of the most interesting um, things that you guys commissioned was this story, uh, like a long, report by Amanda Ripley, I'm gonna show it here, on complicating the narratives. This gets back to what John was saying, I think a minute ago about deep uncertainty. You know, the things we don't know in this around us still dominate the things we do. And journalism has this still this bias as do we all as people toward the aha moment when we'll finally know X. And that, that, that leads to delay. This has been a big part of the climate question 
and it leads to uh, confusion. Yeah. And it's it avoids normalizing that you're reporting in uncertainty. You're you have to make decisions amid uncertainty. There's this de I, I showed the uh, hashtag. I mean the uh, in the uh, Twitter handle for the Society for Decision Making under Deep Uncertainty. It's <laughs> deep uncertainty. It's a thing. I, I spoke at their meeting. <laughs> And they know how to do this. There's tons of people every day who make decisions under deep uncertainty. And that, but in reporters, but reporters, you take uncertainty into the newsroom and that's the last thing you're going to get on a nightly newscast yeah, we don't or, like that. or on the front page. I, I call the front page, the tyranny of the front page thought. And, but Amanda in this article, she articulated many ways as a reporter even in how you ask questions, a lot of this comes from like mediation and th even therapy. Yeah. You ask and questions and take me more, tell me more. Could you talk about that a little bit, Tina? Yeah, this was an amazing project that has gone so viral. I mean, our blog usually gets what, you know, 200 hits for a story. And this one is, I think is up over 200,000. Um, I met a guy in Warsaw, who was, who told me about this article, not knowing that we had anything to do with it. He lives in Tbilisi, he's Georgian, he lives in Tbilisi and like it's a thing there now. Um, but it, it, it always makes me laugh that complication and nuance is such an important part of television, of scripted television these days. We don't want Leave It to Beaver characters anymore. I mean, we need anti-heroes and complication and, and nuance. We get bored if we don't have that. And yet journalism still thinks we live in the 1960s where we want our, our black and white. And part of what you see is in coverage, for example, of the protests in Lansing, Michigan. Um, you know, that's not a lot of people in this doing those protests against um, opening, I mean, against, uh, the, the safety measures that the governor is, is still trying to implement there. But we cover it as if that were the entire uh, right wing. And it's very polarizing. Journalism tends to be create false polarization. We're actually much less polarized than we think we are. But when journalism looks for the extremes on both sides and quotes those people and, and makes, gives this very strong impression that that's how everybody thinks, we all think everybody on the left thinks that everybody on the right is a racist. Everybody on the right thinks that everybody on the left is a snowflake. That is totally not true, but that's the impression that journalism gives. And so this complicating the narratives project is trying to uh, teach journalists how to report and get comfortable with nuances and complexity and not cartoonify and not create this false sense of extremes. We're also extremely vulnerable to imagery. And that, you know, Michigan guys walking around the state house carrying guns. Yeah. It, it's it again and again when I'm pitching a story, you know, one of the first questions is, well, what's the art? And you know, if there's strong art, it's a stronger story, regardless yeah. of content. And yeah. that to me is one of the driving forces that leads a lot of TV news, local TV news, to be so god awful is, you know, if it, bleed, it bleeds, it leads. There's sirens, there's, you know, something to see that's captivating. And people would much rather see things than read things, let's be honest. You know, it's movies are more popular than books and TV's more popular than books and magazines for a reason. People like to see things. And Bob, you know, you, you made your living off of writing to images, right? I mean, that was the idea of good broadcast journalism. You're writing to images. And, and I think we're constrained by that. Well, Bob, you wanted to, that was this is like right in your spot because of the, the as we said the news process. If anything, in TV is more distilled than everywhere than anywhere. Um, well, it, it is a big problem to, to tell a complex story on television. I spent my many decades, as you pointed out, doing that, but it can be done. You have to work harder at it. I think we're seeing some astounding examples of, of, of good reporting on, on that. I, I told a story in this session before about covering a possible outbreak of bird flu in Thailand, and I had spent a good part of my day, and then I got very sick and scared because I had I couldn't do the story unless I stood in front of a bunch of chickens, and so I had to drive all the way out into the Thai countryside to, to get the chickens, and I could not have done that story if I hadn't shown those chickens, 
Uh, that's just part of the, you know, you have to accept that. But that doesn't mean you have to, people who are doing a good job give up. Right. Uh, a lot of, as Tina was pointing out, comp a lot of the complex narratives that you see in scripted television are now showing up in first in podcasts and in some very good television. I think that people can do a good job. Documentaries are very powerful. Enormous amounts of college kids want to be documentary filmmakers. It's the most... Yeah, it's one of the most sought after, at least professions by at least young people. And they don't want to be uh, financial finance kings anymore. They want to yeah. they want to make documentary films. So it, it 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 can be done. People are looking for ways to do it. And uh, you know, the, the polar bear on the iceberg is a very powerful image, and it's not an inaccurate one, right, Andy? Well, there's a whole long story about polar bears. Um and, and I, I, I uh, see ice, um, there were people looking around actively for pictures. I did a piece for the Times about this back in 2006 called Yelling Fire on a Hot Planet, where um, advocates for action, including the, this was a guy at NRDC described how they were actively looking for pictures of drowning polar bears after the uh, science came out that, you know, sea ice was retreating and polar bears were suffering. And it led to some <laughs> gross over, overreach. Um, the, uh, there was a picture of a polar bear looking like this, very woeful in the middle of the uh, open sea, uh, arms up. And when you look carefully, you realize there was a helicopter downdraft. Uh, the photographer overhead was what was distressing the polar bear, not swimming. They're, they're a marine mammal. They're actually protected as a marine mammal. They swim hundreds of miles. So so that like that can bounce back in ways that are really counterproductive in the end too. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a weird world, I guess you'd say. I'll tell you another story about to answer the question. Uh, for local news, particularly, there were all these consulting companies that tell local news how to uh, make a formulaic show, and of course, most of it is sports and weather. We all know that, and those are the most popular things. And, and if it bleeds, it leads, as John pointed out, is the first thing. But then, there for a while, there used to be uh, a what works segment, and what works segments were all were part of local news. We had them on the NBC Nightly for just that that idea. What what you know, you find something like the lemonade stand or the place where they're they're artfully using waste uh, to some good end in a, in a place, but usually they don't add up to much. It, it's just part of a formula of what some focus group has told people that is likely to make a tune in. So if we're doing this. We have to be careful that we're not getting sucked into some somebody's formula about uh, what what is journalism that informs and what is uh, what what is really helpful to people in terms of finding solutions. I, I did I did an eleven I think it was eleven part series with the PBS NewsHour about um, the AIDS epidemic around the world and it was called Far From Over and we did it over several years maybe three four years. And we looked at places that were succeeding and we looked at places that were failing. And we tried to show creative ways to succeed in the places that were failing as well. And I think it was a really successful TV um, series. Uh, and, and I think it succeeded because it was visually captivating. It told complex stories, but it did it through the lens of what Tina's pushing for, is looking for answers and trying to learn from other places. And at COVID-19, to me, that's the central challenge, is really learning from other places and looking at what's working. And there's a fascinating story that Kai Kupferschmidt did for Science this week about um, clusters in COVID-19. And we all know about nursing homes and ships and meatpacking plants and ski resorts. But what Kai's story looked at was the question of, if you're identifying clusters, can you then target those the way that we have with HIV as hotspots and do your testing there, get those people isolated and break the back of population spread by going into the hot zones. And it's a fascinating read because it's a creative way to address the problem everywhere that learns from what's happened everywhere. Are, are there any lessons in how that series you just described came about? It was, you know, it's an interesting um, collaboration between Science Magazine. Yeah, well, I, I came up with the idea and the Pulitzer Center funded it and they married 
uh, they made the marriage happen with the news hour. I, I had my wife used to work at the news hour. I had connections there, but that's not really how it unfolded. Yeah. And uh, and my wife used to joke when she worked at the news hour that it was dare to be boring television. Um, <laughs> It, it, and there's something to that. You know, you have to take a chance that you might bore people to do really good television. And the news hour, I don't think is boring. I think it's captivating. And I think I hope what we did was captivating. But it, it had a, an ethos that was similar to print of let's get the story right. Let's do this. Let it breathe. Give it the space it needs. Mm -hmm. And let's invest the time and money it takes to do that kind of storytelling. So it was really rewarding for me. It was incredibly satisfying. So you, you, these you, kinds of stories are um, are well suited to places like the News Hour. The challenge, is, as you've mentioned, John, is local TV news, and and we are um, that had been the black hole for solutions journalism for uh, the first like five years of our existence. But we started working with local TV news stations in the last two years, and it's been hugely successful. These stories do not have to be long. They do not have to be boring. Um, like one of our partners is KXAN in Austin, Texas, and they've done a series on mental health and kids' suicide that has involved every reporter at the station. It's been extremely popular. Um, viewers love it. And it, it can be done at the local level. Um, it, it does not have to be that if it bleeds, it leads. And in fact, um, we know that, in fact, viewers don't prefer that kind of, of story. There's reasons for TV reporters to do those stories. They have the dramatic visuals, they're easy to do. Just get in your car and go stand in front of the fire. But viewers don't necessarily want that. Well, one of the things, Tina, and you may, may be doing this already, is, you know, I should have also mentioned is these are businesses that make a lot of money uh, the local TV news, mm. and if you give them something on a platter, they they really will take it. They're they're suckers for <laughs> people giving things away, and if, they, if if they're convinced that it doesn't show an obvious conflict of interest for them to take it, it's pretty easy to get stuff on local news, and it's a very ripe market for that. There are some entities that are trying to facilitate local coverage of tough issues. Climate Central, climatecentral.org. Yeah. They had John, John Upton there, who was a really great reporter, done wonderful big series on biofuels, scams, and the like. Um, he's now their partnerships editor. So he, he, if there's a study, this is all in the context of climate, if there's a study coming out on wildfire vulnerability in the West, he'll go to the map and look at the landscape of media in that region and offer their, con their contextual capacity to do the mapping and the like so that the local media can have that. Uh, impact. I'm not sure if that exists yet for uh, COVID-19. I've talked with him actually about can we flip that model into this uh, this space um, as well. It just seems like, just like what John was saying about getting Science Magazine together with PBS, um, there seem to be ways to do those kinds of things that we haven't maybe thought of yet. I'm not sure if that resonates, um, Tina, with some of the things you guys are working on. Andy, doesn't Climate Central also work with local meteorologists quite successfully? They do. Yeah, it's uh, they 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 and others okay. had a training program around how to how to how to cover the weather and uh, insert some context related to climate at the same time. It's and that's successful too. Yeah, but, they're very they're very trusted local meteorologists and they're very receptive to talking about uh, climate and not just weather. So that that's been a great program of theirs. But it would it be you know in the public health context it would be very interesting to see if that same thing can well I'll I'll sift around on social media to see if it's already happening I would love to think so um, and if not then you know institutions that have that big capacity whether it's John Hop Johns Hopkins or Columbia's public health people are really good and I, I I always I often think in this context of what universities can do to help fill some of that gap the California University of California system is a vast resource full of brilliant people. Uh, who maybe can do some of the mapping that can spill into local coverage. Even the, the, but and then ultimately, I think the media will be left behind, frankly, if they don't. Uh, this was a, the Johns Hopkins climate, uh, the COVID tracker. Uh, I just was uh, talking about this the other day. Uh, I talk about it almost every day. That, that came about, that multi-billion view resource came about because of... Um, Two people in the engineering department back in January said, "Oh, this this is really a big issue," and they put it out there. And you know, they could work with media 
now media are using it all the time anyway, or they could just facilitate that direct access to the information. Um, and and I, I sometimes I talk about this and say to people in the news business, you again, you could just be left in the dust if you're not there to be a mediator and a connector. Um, then that's fine. But I don't know how if that feels. Well, take, the devil, take, take the devil's advocate position with that right now with COVID, not with the other things we're talking about, which are all excellent. Everybody wants to know, and I'm, a, I'm sounding like a broken record here, but everybody wants to know if they can safely you pick it, send their kid to school, go to the grocery store, go to a restaurant, yeah. uh, and whether they're putting themselves in a the family at risk by doing that. And the questions are pretty often very individualized because it has to do with what, it, what, what the area and how much has been in the family already, uh, how much disease has been in the family. But could solutions journalism help people answer those kind of questions. Uh, if you have a, a local person from a school of public health in that area sitting down answering questions, yeah, that would be very helpful. Uh, but in terms of a generalized presentation, I'm not so sure that you, you could because it's, the questions are very much tailored to the individual's uh, yeah. situation, which varies enormously. Yeah, I think you're right, Bob. That, that's a very valuable form of journalism. It's not, it's not what we would consider solutions journalism, which is also a very valuable form of journalism. There, there are again examples from elsewhere that are informative. You know, like Singapore staged school hours so that they have fewer students gathering during the day. So you'd have a morning session or an afternoon session. The University of California at San Diego here is going to open up in the fall because they're going to test all students that live in the dorms repeatedly, aggressively. And I, I think those are good solution stories. The, it's showing a way forward. Are they going to solve the problem? Not necessarily, but it's offering ideas. And that to me is what it's about is, tell me something I don't know. It's new, it's news, inform me. That's what I want as, a, as, you know, as a, somebody who, gobbles up information and news. I want you to tell me things I don't know that can somehow inform me about how to move forward. That sounds like a reasonable path. Um, there's an interesting, some good comments have come in. Paula Hennan says, look for Dr. Jen Runkel, epidemiologist at NCEI, who works for Cooperative Institute for Climate and Satellites. Uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to look into that. One of the great frustrations I'm having is all of these journalists have come into my world, right? Because COVID-19 is a science story at its core. Yeah. And all these people who are asking Trump questions, for example, very few of them have any, show off any real sophisticated knowledge of science. Wendy's shaking her head, she knows this. And, and I was speaking to a scientist yesterday who told me about what he told a famous TV anchor person off camera yesterday, which was, you guys have to approach this more like you're covering politics. You have to be critical of, of everything you're hearing and go through it carefully and don't just start pushing one person's message. And that's the frustrating thing I have is it's all these journalists who aren't, who are great journalists, they're good at their jobs. They just aren't that skilled at critically analyzing complicated scientific information. And so how do you, sense of the CDC's decision to put out a new message right. about fomites. You know, I mean, and okay, yeah. CDC put out the message. That doesn't mean they're right. <laughs> it's, and, and we shouldn't just accept things. We should be critical as journalists and skeptical, not cynical, but skeptical. And that to me is the greatest challenge in covering COVID-19, not for me, but for the pack of journalists that are rushing into my world. Actually, yeah, Tina, is there is there a form of solutions journalism that works inside the Beltway? <laughs> There's a question. You know, covering that mess. I would say no. Yeah, I would um, say no it's, too. <laughs> it's not a tool for breaking news. Again, it's but you can cover politics as a field. For example, here's how Utah made the transition to vote by mail. Um, they did it county by county. That's an interesting message for other states that want to do this. But that's taking politics like health or education or environment or crime. 
it's not covering what somebody said and the response. That's something I don't think you can use solutions journalism for. There's no solutions journalism coverage of, of Trump. And although let's dig in on that slightly because there is Jay Rosen at NYU who I've had on this show, this program, this webcast, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, he said the media have, have been utterly failing to break the pattern of call and response. It's like a call and response song. Trump tweets or puts on a, says something about a mask and the media says you're wrong. And that's like the story. <laughs> and he he's insisting that the media have been co-opted into this model and that there's a solution, which is to focus on expertise on the issue at hand. And for him, like testing, like that Johns Hopkins graph, you know, having the daily drumbeat of, that's going to make people feel like something useful is coming through their screen should be the things that matter to people at risk. Um, so you're it, saying the solution for covering Trump is not to cover, not to well, cover. <laughs> well, as he said, you know, this came out when Jay was one of the people who was saying just the idea that you always have to jump to the feed when the White House was putting on a press conference is a, that's a pattern. It's, it's, it's a news decision. It's a newsroom decision. Yeah. And, um, you can have that as a little box for people who want to go to the press conference on yeah. your, your website, but why does that have to be the foreground story? This is where I think one of the solutions for the media, with, I don't know if it's a solution, I don't know the answer yet, is your if your metric of success is eyeballs or page views, you're gonna you're dooming us all to a diet of overflow and lack of meaning. But increasingly for the media, that's not the metric of success. Um, and that was the metric of success when advertising was the business model. But advertising is has right. been dying for a long time. And, and I think in the last two months, it's been, stake has been driven through its heart. Mm -hmm. um, advertising sells a portion of the reader's attention to an advertiser. Any other business model sells journalism to the reader. And that's um, that's a different. You're measuring something very different. You're not interested in clickbait for that. You're interested in stories that readers will will stay with, will spend time with, will engage with, stories that build trust between the the, the outlet and and the community. Um, and that and that's a good change. For the first time, the the business model of journalism is going to be aligned with good journalism. Of course, the bad side of that is. Places that were dependent on advertising are dead, and that's a lot of places. But those that survive are going to be the ones that can that can switch. That's a really good way of summarizing it. Could you just say that one more time? That 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 what you said about the advertising model versus just just repeat it, just because this is audio. Yeah, yeah. yeah the yeah. I mean, advertising works by selling a portion of the reader's attention to a company that wants to advertise. Um. The new business model is selling journalism to readers. Right. Um, and that's and that is a business model that's aligned with good journalism. Advertising never was. If people are willing to pay. Or if someone, you know, if philanthropists are willing to pay, if people are willing to be members. I don't think reader pay is going to be a successful model for 97% of the newsrooms that are out there. Um, sure. Sure. Works for the New York Times. It's always been subsidized. Uh, it always. Yeah. And yeah. You know, Robert Barron subsidized it. Philanthropists are subsidizing it now. Right. I'm not so worried about the philanthropist model, frankly. I, I think philanthropists can do good. And if they believe in the core principles of journalism, come on along. Give us your billions. I'd love it. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. I'm not so frightened by this period of getting away from advertising. What frightens me is seeing all these good journalists struggling to make money and to find jobs because there aren't enough philanthropists out there and there aren't enough business models that are working to support really the high, I mean, we've raised the bar substantially and COVID-19 proves it. The reporting today is spectacular. It's the best disease reporting I've ever seen of any outbreak or epidemic. Wow, it is excellent. that's interesting. It's excellent. The New York Times, the Wall Street Journal and all these online magazines day in, day out, I'm competing with them and they're mm -hmm. beating me. And you know, when you did that New York Times Magazine story in 2010, <laughs> it, 
it was such a, a shock to me when that came out because there weren't that many people, even though there was a big group of people covering HIV AIDS, weren't that many people who could scoop me. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you did. And, and it was a story. I kicked myself repeatedly for not breaking that story. And how did she get it? Why didn't I see that? Nowadays, every day I get up and there are 10, 20 stories I look at and say, I wish that had my name on it. It's yeah. that good. The quality is incredibly high. Yes, there's a lot of junk, more than ever, blah, blah, blah. But come on. I mean, look, pick up the news, pick up the New York Times, pick up good magazines, go through websites. that. But the New York Times isn't in danger. Good magazines will survive. That's not the problem. Yeah. The problem is the news deserts in local journalism around the country. There are huge swaths of the United States that have no local news source anymore. That is the problem. Absolutely. And, and that is a, a very big danger to democracy. That's, That's right. the and issue. Absolutely. And to get back to it, every one of the reasons for the problem that John was just describing is that COVID or, or affects everybody. There's never been a story in my lifetime or uh, I can think about that where every family in the United States and probably in the world has to consider what its risk for COVID is. And so every bit of information is critical. And that's why there's so many good reporters and bad reporters covering this because there's an enormous appetite for information. There's not an enormous appetite for information about almost any other subject you can pick. This, everybody has to decide, are they gonna to go to the grocery store today? Is it safe to go to the grocery store? Is it safe to go take their kids to the playground? Uh, is it okay to go for a drive or get on a bus or, you know, thousands of things that are part of everyday life and it affects everybody. We've never had a story like that uh, probably since the second world war. And that, that's a good place to sort of draw this to a close. This has been a great round of um, our, our weekly news versus noise uh, discussion on sustain what this um, novel experiment <laughs> in a constructive conversation around uh, how we make it through this mess uh, with the least regrets, um, falling forward without falling down, as um, Emerson put it in the 1840s, is, is, is moving from running to walking. Can we figure this out? A uh, great uh, bunch of people here today. Tina Rosenberg, Solutions Journalism Network. Thank you so much for being part of this. Uh, John Cohen, as always, from Science Magazine, from the West Coast, and Wendy Wertheimer from Washington, D.C., long timer at NIH and um, at WHO, and Bob Bazell, uh, a TV presence uh, for decades. Uh, Lori Garrett would be here normally, but she's racing to finish a re revisions to her book, The Coming Plague from 1994, when she essentially laid out the landscape of what we're now seeing. And she's got to get that done. Uh, on, on Sunday, we revert here to our weekend chill out version of this broadcast, which is uh, songwriters and storytellers. Uh, actually, Reverend Billy Talon, who's an activist, comedian, performance artist, who, who, who runs the Church of Stop Shopping. It's a sort of consumer activism force uh, to be reckoned with. He's got to kind of sermonize, but we'll also have some great, some great tunes from some uh, songwriters that people will enjoy. And then next week, back into the battle uh, for sanity and trying to make information matter. Sustain What is a global conversation that is uh, uh, identifying solutions to the complicated, shape-shifted, and epic challenges of humanity's great acceleration a prime focus is making sense of and getting the most out of the planet's fast forward information environment. It's the one earth system changing faster than the actual environment. This webcast is produced as part of my work building Columbia University's new Earth Institute initiative on communication and sustainability. We're hoping to sustain this initiative. So get in touch if you want to. For the time being, these sessions will focus on mitigating the unfolding societal disruption from and economic disruption from this virus. Uh, but we'll dip into other subjects and solutions when the time is right. A lot coming on climate and on biodiversity and in general disaster resilience. So thank you for all for being with us, uh, listeners, viewers, watchers, and uh, and stay tuned and focus on solutions wherever you are. Thank you very much. <laughs>